So what my goal is this afternoon with this talk is to give you at least three or four practical tips that you can take home in your practice and use that doesn't need uh, endoscopes and fluoroscopy or any uh, high-tech equipment, um, but things that you can take home and really um, put into practice immediately. So really the goal of this talk is, is hopefully uh, for you to, to, to change a little bit the way that uh, you uh, treat some of your patients' urinary tract and, how, uh, and give you some pointers also um, on the physical examination. So what the plan is, and we'll see how much we get through, is just to have a different take on how to examine the urinary tract, both in, uh, in dogs and cats. We'll also uh, talk about doing urohydropulsion, so how we can accomplish that in practice. Retro urohydropulsion, that will also uh, save your day when you've got uh, encrusted urethral stones. Um, we'll briefly go over some options for minimally uh, invasive stone removal, and then we'll talk about doing cystourethrograms in clinics with just one x-ray, only one x-ray during avoiding phase. And then, uh, and then we'll finish off with uh, some new stats on ureteral obstruction. So we'll start off with what percentage of the urinary tract can be examined on physical examination. And a lot of times when patients are presenting with urinary tract problems, um, we're thinking about doing a rectal palpation, let's say in a male dog, to feel the prostate. Um, but there's lots more that can be felt on rectal than just the prostate. So in order to answer that question, let's look at the male dog. Male dog that comes in with some dysuria, polycuria. If we start at the end, what we can do is we can evaluate the prepuce. We can evaluate the tip of the urethra. We can actually feel the os penis, and ventrally, um, the os penis is not complete, uh, the os has a ventral um, portion that's not complete where the urethra runs through. So you can actually palpate that area, and by palpating it, you'll feel stones or masses. Um, but you can easily feel stones in that area that sometimes on x-rays are not all that obvious because the stone can be superimposed on the os. So very important to feel that area. Then you can continue palpating the urethra in back of the os, because we know that that's where stones tend to lodge, because that's where the urethral lumen will decrease in size. And so right in back of the os, it's an area that's really important to palpate um, because that's where you're going to feel stones that are, are lodged there. After that, you can take, feel the urethra all the way up to the perineum, and you can actually palpate that area of the urethra on physical exam. After that, with your rectal palpation, you're able on the ventral floor to feel the urethra. And the urethra should feel kind of like an, a little bit of an empty, small hose, just... Um, Nothing hard or lumpy or bumpy. Uh, the urethra should not be filled with urine if there's no obstruction. Um, so by doing a rectal palpation, yes, you can evaluate the prostate, but it's really important to feel the urethra too. In female dogs, you can palpate the vagina, um, and you can feel the urethral papilla, but then by rectal palpation, you can also feel the urethra. So female dogs should also undergo uh, rectal palpation because that really allows you to feel, really palpate the urethra. And uh, probably about once a month, I, we get a dog that's referred uh, for dysuria, polycuria, female dog, recurrent urinary tract infections, and the dog's been seen by multiple specialists. They've had x-rays, they've had ultrasound, urinalysis, culture, UPCR, sodium excretion, potassium excretion, complete neurologic exams, no one's been able to find why these patients are dysuric, polycuric. On rectal palpation, we feel a mass within the urethra and it's TCC. So it's really, really, really important to always do a rectal palpation in these patients. And the reason is that that portion of the urethra that courses through the pelvis is not visible uh, on ultrasound. So even if you have an ultrasound that's done, you can very, very easily miss urethral disease. And I'd say at least once a month that's happening in our clinic is that these cases are referred in after thousands of dollars of working them up without a diagnosis. We do a rectal palpation and we feel that there's a mass. It's really, really important. So to come back a little bit to what percentage of the urinary tract can be uh, examined, depends on the size of the patient, but your entire urethra practically can be examined, and then you can do a, an abdominal palpation to feel the bladder. So between 80 and 100% of the urinary tract can be examined on physical exam. If we look at cats, um, because of their tinier orifices, under sedation, you can definitely do a rectal palpation and feel the urethra really well in cats, but that usually takes, a, takes sedation. And it depends on the size of your fingers also.
So how many of you, please raise your hand, have had problems catheterizing a female dog? Okay, so the rest of you goes really well. Well, for those of you who have had problems, I will give you a trick that you will always be able to succeed in catheterizing your female dogs. Never again will you have a problem, I promise. So what you do is under sedation, you place them in ventral recumbency, and knowing the anatomy is key. And so what you have here on the, on the screen, on the upper shot, is the dog in ventral recumbency. So the black arrow is pointing to the vagina, and the yellow star is the urethral papilla. So the urethral papilla is ventral, the vagina is dorsal. The vagina is much bigger than the urethral papilla, which is why when you go in blindly, or even when you have a speculum and you're not really seeing the urethral papilla very well, is that you're always landing up in the vagina. And that's the frustrating part. You put the catheter in, you're in the vagina, you keep going over and over again, you just repeat the same error. What you can do in patients in which you can stick a finger, that they're big enough that you can do a vaginal palpation, just stick your finger into the vagina and block the vaginal opening. After that, you take a urinary catheter and you slide it ventrally to your finger. As your finger is in the vaginal, uh, blocking the vagina, just pull up a little bit with your finger. That helps elevate everything and open up the papilla. And then you advance your urinary catheter. So if your vagina is blocked with your finger and you lift it up a little bit, that's gonna open up your papilla. Your urinary catheter only has one place it can go and it will go into your urethra. So with that trick, you will always, always, the, your catheter will no longer slide in the vagina and start over again. It will always slide into the papilla. If you have very large fingers or a very small patient and you're not able to block off um, the vagina, then what you can do uh, is take a Foley catheter, go in blind. When you go in blind with a Foley catheter, it'll go into the vagina because that's the biggest hole. You can gently fill the balloon up while pulling it backwards until it, this catheter stays within the vagina. And then you slide, again, the urinary catheter in. With the vagina blocked, your urinary catheter will definitely go into your papilla. So that's really a trick in order to help you always be able to get into um, the urethra in all your female patients. For catheter selection, I just put a bunch of different catheters up there. Obviously, we all have your, your own um, preferences. Um, cats have, female cats have quite large urethras, so often we're able to get not only a five French, but an eight French catheter um, into kitties. And Foley catheters are quite useful when we want to leave catheters in long term. So I guess I have a question for you. Is it really necessary to measure your catheter? or you've been doing it for a while, you don't really need to. How many of you think it's necessary, absolutely, to measure your catheter? Raise your hand. Okay, so probably about a third if you measure your catheter or feel it's important to measure your catheter. It's not an urban legend that catheters don't kink or turn tie knots in the bladder. And so I've had a few patients that have been referred in which catheters were inserted and, and they knotted in the bladder. And I personally have done it a couple of times too. Thankfully, we were going to surgery anyway, so it wasn't that big a deal. Um, but it does happen. And even if you think you know where the bladder is, sometimes it surprises you. If you haven't palpated the bladder and measured from your urethral orifice to your bladder, always do it, please. So I always hope that this radiograph will traumatize you and make you, it, it, for me, it, after I've, it happened to me personally, I always, always measure my urinary catheter. If you uh, use Foley catheters often enough, it may happen at one point that your balloon doesn't um, empty. So everything's good, you've placed your catheter, it's been for a couple of days, now it's time to deflate the balloon and remove your catheter. But the balloon will not deflate. If this happens, don't worry. You can try cutting your catheter. Um, but if it still doesn't deflate, as long as you have ultrasound, just go in there with a needle, do it as if you were doing a cystocentesis. Hit the balloon, bust it, pull the catheter out. No worries. This doesn't happen often, but when it happens, you'll be happy that you don't have to worry about it. Because it can be a little stressful when that happens. How many of you catheterize female cats? Please raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're scared to try catheterizing a female cat because female dogs are so hard. 
Okay, so it's a little scary to think of catheterizing a female cat, but please do go ahead and do it. It's so much easier than female dogs. The reason is, we have the anatomy up there. Uh, in ventral recumbency, the vagina is teeny tiny and the urethra is huge. The urethral papilla is absolutely huge. So eight, nine times out of 10, when you go in blindly, because the vulva is so tiny, you can't really get your finger in there, but when you go in blindly, you're able to get the, the catheter into the urethra without a problem. So please, you'll look like a superstar. You just put the, the catheter in and it slides right into the bladder. People will be very impressed. Catheterizing a male dog, I won't spend a lot of time on because I think we do it routinely and it doesn't cause too much problems for us. The only issue I think sometimes that happens is as you're advancing the catheter, um, where the pelvic flexure is, the catheter can get caught in um, some mucosal folds. So having uh, someone just pull the prepuce forward towards you and have someone flush with saline just helps distend the urethral lumen and allows easier passage of the catheter. Catheterizing cats, again, we've all learned this. What's really important is because of the anatomy um, is to avoid sticking a catheter um, straight through without taking the prepuce and bending it towards the anus to, strengthen, uh, to straighten out the urethra so that the catheter can easily glide through the urethra. Um, so that's really important because in the patients that we see um, ruptures and tears, often that's the site, right? At the flexure is where uh, there's going to be a urethral tear. In really difficult to catheterize cats, there's guide wires, and after, uh, during the break, if you'd like some more information, I can give that to you, but guide wires are like little tiny slippery wires that go through lumens, and we'll find the lumen for you. And so in really difficult to catheterize cats that will slide right into the urethra, through the urethral lumen into the bladder, and you're able to get an open-ended um, urinary catheter right through it. So it basically rides over or through the wire and is able to get be uh, placed within the bladder. And this is just showing you where tears tend to occur if you're going in straight. Um, you, you cause a little tear in the urethral mucosa, and that's why every time you try to advance your catheter, your catheter just keeps going into that tear over and over and over again, and then you start seeing the perineum swell up. And so in cases like that, it's going to be very challenging to get a catheter in because a catheter is always going to follow the path of least resistance, um, which is where the guide wire can help. Um, and there's also a way that you can go in through the bladder and pass a guide wire, and that way you're, you're coming out um, in the other way. So how many of you are doing urohydropulsion in your clinics to remove small stones? Please raise your hand. Okay, great. So there's lots of you. Um, so this is a really, really great technique to remove debris um, and small stones from the bladder. I usually don't do this in male cats because of the small size of the penile urethra. I'm always concerned that debris will block and then I'll land up with an obstructed kitty. However, it works really, really well in female cats and female dogs, given the large size of the urethra uh, and the fact that it's, it's pretty short. In male dogs, it can work also. I just find not as well because of the, the long penile uh, and pelvic urethra and the flexure. You can't get kind of as much, uh, as much pressure kind of built in, in that system to help um, get rid of the stones. So how this is done is it's done under general anesthesia. I've tried doing under sedation, always do it under general anesthesia. That's where uh, you get full relaxation. And what you want to do is fill the bladder up with saline um, and then uh, put the pa patient in standing position. In order to do that, we want to make sure that if we're going to be doing urohydropulsion to expel stones from the bladder, we have to make sure that those stones are small enough to pass. Um, and so how are we going to determine that? I just have a chart here for kind of small dogs and cats, because it's usually small dogs that uh, we have stones in that we want to remove. Um, a lot of the calcium oxalate stones are in our, our small male dogs, our female dogs, if they're struvite stones, and certainly we should try medical dissolution um, before doing your hydropulsion. So in male dogs, as long as stones are less than three millimeters, they can usually be retro, uh, hydropulsed out of the, uh, the urinary tract. In female dogs, about four millimeters. In female cats, it's less than 2.5 millimeters. So now I have a question for you is, um, how do you measure stones? Because we have, to ha we have to be pretty exact in measuring stones. We're talking about three millimeters, four millimeters. We want to make the proper decision and not attempt urohydropulsion if it's not um, appropriate. 
for the patient. So we have radiographs or we have ultrasound. So let's vote. Who uses radiographs to measure stones or who feels that radiographs are the best to measure stones? Please raise your hand. Okay, and please raise your hand if you feel ultrasound. All right, so there's more ultrasound people than, than uh, radi radiograph people. Ultrasound is absolutely fantastic to evaluate the bladder wall, to evaluate for soft tissue masses, to evaluate for non-radiopaque stones. However, the best way, the most exact way to measure stones are on radiographs. So to determine the number of stones and the size of the stones, it's really important to measure them on radiographs. Ultrasound tends to overestimate the size of stones. So if we look on ultrasonography, because of um, the dispersion of uh, the ultrasound waves, it tends to make the stones look larger. And occasionally, you can have two or three stones that are all stuck together that just look like one big stone, but they're actually multiple small stones. So please, if you're going to be attempting your hydropulsion or any other minimally invasive um, removal of stones and you need exact measurements, it's really, really important for you to measure them on radiographs and have either a ruler or even just a coin or anything that you can use as a scale to make sure that you're accounting for distortion. So for your hydropulsion, you need to fill the bladder up with saline. And in female uh, small dogs and cats, it's great to hold them up in a standing position because then gravity helps eliminate the stones from the urinary tract. Let's say that despite all the tricks, you just have that one patient that you cannot get a urinary catheter in, female. Because usually I think males were able to catheterize. Can we still do urohydropulsion? Or do we have to abandon and go to cystotomy or do something else? Well, you know what? There's actually, everywhere it's written, if you're gonna do urohydropulsion, you have to get a urinary catheter in there. You've gotta fill the bladder up with saline. I agree, however, you can fill the bladder up with saline without putting a UCATH in to the urethra. What you can actually do, so get the UCATH in the bladder. If you can't do it, what you can do is take your orange or your, your tip catheter or your, your urinary catheter, place it into the vestibule, gently close the lips of the vulva so that the vulva is closed, and gently inject saline into the vestibule and have someone palpating the bladder. As you inject saline into the vestibule, it'll fill the vagina, but it will also fill the urethra, which will then fill the bladder. And there's no danger that you're going to rupture the urethra, or and there's no danger you're gonna rupture the vagina, even if in, in a spayed animal. As you're slowly infusing, as a pressure builds up, if you're filling up your vagina, the urethra will fill, the bladder will fill. And once your bladder is nicely filled, then you can do urohydropulsion. So as much as now we know how to pass urinary catheters, and I'm sure it'll go well for you, if you're not able to place a urinary catheter, no worries, you can still do urohydropulsion, but you just do it by sticking a catheter into the vestibule and filling passively. So here's a video um, doing urohydropulsion on a kitty. So the kitty's had a UCAT pass. The bladder's nice and, and big. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm grabbing the bladder and I'm shaking it back and forth. The reason I'm doing that is to get debris um, to fall into the trigonal area and, and to fall as caudal as possible and to fall into the, to the urethra also. And then what I'm going to do is I'm getting a really go good stream. I don't know if you're able to appreciate that pretty strong stream there to the female cat. What I've done is I've taken the bladder and I've lifted it up towards the head and I've um, compressed it. If you take the bladder and push it down, then you're going to have a curve in your urethra, and that curve in your urethra is gonna prevent you from getting really, really good pressure. And so what's important uh, when, you're, when you're doing your hydropulsion is to make sure you pull that bladder up towards the head so you get a nice straight urethra, and then you've got really good pressure and you're able to get stones out. And it's really exciting because the stones just fly out. Uh, often, after doing this two or three times, often all the stones are gone, so I always take x-rays to make sure that the stones are no longer there, or we can look on ultrasound, because ultrasound will tell us if there's still some stones remaining or not. Um, just one thing that's happened to me a couple of times, when I've had kind of larger stones that were supposed to pass, and I was doing this technique, and I'm pressing on the bladder, and I've got a really good stream, and then all of a sudden there's no more stream, the bladder's big, no more stream. 
don't keep pushing because probably what's happened is you've pushed a stone that's maybe just a little bit too big or a stone that's a little prickly like a calcium oxalate that's now adhered to the mucosa and is sticking to the mucosa. And if that happens and you've got obstruction and if you keep pressing on the bladder, you could cause rupture. If that happens, don't worry. Just lie the patient back down, re put a catheter in, flush that, that um, stone back into the bladder and then use another way to remove stones. Either go to surgery or use another uh, way because that stone is not going to pass. It became lodged in the urethra so we won't try to do that twice. Another technique uh, that's kind of the opposite of uh, urohydropulsion, so retro urohydropulsion, is a really um, nice technique to take stones that are stuck in the urethra and get them into the bladder. No one wants to do surgery on a urethra. It bleeds, it strictures. Um, so we really want to get those stones back into the bladder so that we can remove them. Um, a lot of times, just by taking a urinary catheter and flushing, you'll be able to get those stones back in. But in the rare circumstances where those stones are stuck there, and you put your catheter in, you can't get your catheter in, or your catheter is going beside the stones, then this is a really good trick to get them to go into the bladder. So you need someone to put on a glove and palpate, uh, do a rectal palpation, and stick their finger on, feel the urethra, and compress the urethra against the pelvis gently, so that they've blocked off the pelvic urethra. Take a catheter with an open end because you want to be able to flush forward. You don't want to have a catheter with side holes that's just flushing sideways. You want to get some good pressure to push the, the, the stone forward. Um, so you insert the catheter into the urethra. You hold off the tip of the urethra so that as you um, inject saline, you get nice distension of the urethra. Now the person who has their finger in the rectum is going to say, hey, I, I'm feeling the urethra distend. You're going to really feel the urethra distend quite a bit, and that's good. Continue injecting, and then you ask the person to release pressure while you continue injecting. And what that's going to do is create a wave that's going to take the stones and push them right back into the bladder. And 99% of the time, you're going to be able to get those stones, even if they're embedded within the mucosa, stuck within the mucosa, you're going to get a good enough wave that's going to take those stones and push them back into the bladder. And if it doesn't work on the first time, then you can do it two or three times. Always have the person hold off the urethra until there's a lot, a lot, a lot of distension. You continue flushing, you let it go, and the wave carries the stones into the bladder. The reason that works so well is that a lot of times, especially these calcium oxalate stones, they're like Velcro. They've got little fingers and they hold on to the urethral mucosa and the mucosa is adhered and holds them into place. So when you're trying to push them with a catheter, they just won't move. But when you inject saline into the urethra, you're distending the urethra. So the urethra is unsticking from around the stones, allowing the stones to be free within the urethral lumen, and then that allows you to really be able to flush them back into the bladder. So this is really going to save you um, when you've got those, those urethral stones in these small little dogs that you just cannot get rid of. Works really well. And there's a bunch of different um, stone removal techniques that uh, can be done. And I guess I just put this um, algorithm up here just to encourage you to kind of go through that. So when you have a patient that's presented to you with stones, is kind of go through the algorithm and say, well, can these be medically dissolved? Maybe, well then let's try medical dissolution. If they fail medical dissolution, then are they small enough for me to do urohydropulsion? If they are, then fantastic, I can go ahead and do that. Um, if these people are willing to be referred and, and it's available in where I practice, um, different uh, minimally invasive techniques and all the better. Um, and if that's not available, then, then we can go to cystotomy. But just to go through the different options um, and find out what's available and give options to owners. Um, because as time goes on, more and more people are familiar with stone disease um, and there's more options for stone removal. So I have actually a table, I know we looked a little bit at this uh, yesterday, there's um, lithotripsy, so you can break the stone up into smaller fragments. And once the stone's broken into smaller fragments, then you can remove it with a stone basket. So it's kind of like doing urohydropulsion too. You can just clear the smaller um, stones out. And I have a table here that might be a little bit small for you that are in the back. And I think some of it's actually a little bit cut out. Um, but it's just a quick reference table to kind of give you an idea, size of stone versus the sex of the animal. What are some of the minimally invasive um, ways? So it kind of summarizes some of the previous slides that we've had. <laughs> 
There is also this approach. It works really well um, just to remove stones. And I guess what I've learned from this approach that basically goes in through the apex of the bladder and, and just um, goes in and doesn't play around too much with the mucosa is that there's ways for you that if you're doing cystotomies, and I think most of you are probably doing cystotomies to remove stones in your practice, there are things that you can do during your cystotomy to make it a little bit less invasive for your patients and to cause a little less damage to the bladder mucosa so that healing is faster. So the bladder actually has uh, a mucus layer that protects it, much like the stomach does. And when that mucus layer is damaged, um, then gastric acid or urine is going to attack the epithelium underneath and cause ulcers and pain. Um, so if you can leave that mucus layer intact as much as possible, then that really helps protect um, the, the bladder. And so if you're doing a cystotomy and you're opening up the bladder, instead of taking a spoon or, or scraping the mucosa and scraping all the mucus off with the stones, you can use forceps and remove the stones. That way you're just touching the stones and you're not pulling all the mucus off. You can also take a syringe and just um, uh, with a, a jet of saline, just unstick some of the stones that might be adhered to the, to the mucosa instead of scraping them off because just by, by flushing with saline is going to allow a gentler uh, removal of the stones without scraping all the mucus. So trying to keep that mucus intact as much as possible when you're doing cystotomy, it's really going to help these patients recover and feel better and have less dysuria and polycuria and hematuria post-op. The other thing that I learned through this procedure is that at the apex of the bladder, it's very fibrotic. You can almost see through it. Um, and there's much less receptors in that area, so pain receptors. Most of the pain receptors are located in the trigone. So if you can make your incisions as much as possible more towards the apex of the bladder, you've got a urinary catheter in, so you can flush those stones you know, more to the apex of the, uh, of the bladder, then you're going to have less discomfort if your incision is more towards the apex and stay away from the trigone where you have a lot more receptors, pain receptors, a lot more discomfort as healing occurs too. Um, the, less, the least suture material and the, the most quickly absorbable suture material is desirable for bladders because the most recent statistics uh, that have come out is that up to 20% of stones that recur in cats and dogs actually have a suture nidus. So what that tells us is that when we go in there and we do a cystotomy in a stone forming animal and there's suture material, even if we're careful and we try not to put too much in the lumen, there's always some that goes through, well that is going to serve as a nidus for future stone formation. So that too can be kept in mind. Um, because up to 20%, and that's new, uh, up, up until a couple of weeks ago, we thought it was only 10%, but there's some new statistics that came out that said up to 20% uh, have a suture nidus. So that's really important to keep in mind too when you're doing cystotomies. I also want to give you some tricks on how to take some biopsies of bladder masses in your practice without having to refer for surgery or without having to refer, or actually you probably do the surgery yourself, but having to refer for cystoscopy and biopsy. Um, so how many of you have ultrasound in your practice? Do you want to even if it's not a good ultrasound, it doesn't matter. Any ultrasound in your practice? Raise your hand. Okay, which is, that's fantastic because in North America, only about 50% um, of practitioners have ultrasound. So that's amazing. It really allows you to explore and look at the urinary tract really well. And I am not at all good in ultrasound. I never really received any formal training in ultrasound, but I find the urinary tract is pretty easy. It's not like searching for adrenals or a pancreas. It's pretty easy to evaluate. So the bladder also is an organ that's pretty easy once you're, you're used to doing a little bit of ultrasound. So if you have a bladder mass and you're wondering, is it a clot, is it a polyp, or could this be cancer, um, you can actually get a little biopsy um, with a catheter. So when you put a urinary catheter into the bladder, you see it very, very well on ultrasound. And here I have a picture, but you've probably already noticed that. I'm sure you've probably already done ultrasound on some of your block cats that you put a catheter in. If you have a bladder mass, like we're seeing here, well, what you can do is you put your catheter in, and with ultrasound guidance, um, you bring the catheter up to where the mass is. If it's like hovering above, then you can just take urine out of the bladder, and it's going to bring your catheter closer to the mass. Or what you can do is just press on the belly, and that's going to bring your catheter down. So you can basically, just by pressing on the abdomen, guide your catheter up right against the bladder mass, and then aspirate. Don't flush, just aspirate. And by aspirating, 
a lot of times, if it's a polyp, you might not get very much, but if it's a blood clot or uh, a tumor such as lymphoma or transitional cell carcinoma, which is most common in dogs, you're going to get chunks of tissue. So then you pull that catheter out, you flush saline through it, and you'll get the chunks of tissue that are at the tip of your catheter. So this is actually a really nice way to get samples of debris, masses, anything within your bladder. You've got all the equipment you need. You've got a urinary catheter, a syringe, the patient's sedated or anesthetized, and you've got ultrasound to guide you. And you're able to really go in there and do it two or three times. You're able to get some really nice biopsies. You can also do a traumatic flush where you flush saline in and you get cells. And certainly while we're doing this procedure, we'll often do both. I just want to try to get a diagnosis as much as possible. Um, but it's always nice to get a biopsy because sometimes on cytology, it's not diagnostic. It, there could be dysplastic changes, inflammation. Sometimes it's a little bit of a difficult call, but usually on biopsy, we're able to make that call. So that works really, really, oops, that works really well. Um, the other thing is that if some of you have biopsy forceps in your practice, you can also use those. Once they're luper, lubricated, they can easily slide up the urethra um, and into the bladder. And again, with the same technique on ultrasound, you can kind of play around with the bladder uh, with your abdominal wall and push your forceps so that they biopsy the bladder. The only danger, I would say, is that it's, you could actually rupture the bladder doing this because if you advance your forceps too much, they're rigid, they will go through the apex of the bladder and rupture. So you just have to be very, very careful about measuring them very well if you're going to be using forceps to get biopsies. How many of you are doing contrast radiographs in your practice right now? If you want to raise your hand, please. Okay, so there's actually quite a few of you, which is good. And I, I certainly learned how to do contrast radiographs um, because I, went, I finished vet school in, uh, in the early 90s, but then after that, it seems like we started kind of putting them aside and just using ultrasound to evaluate the urinary tract. And I think that's definitely a mistake for the urethra because there's, we can't evaluate the urethra, or at least most of the urethra, on, uh, on ultrasound. So it's really important to use iodinated contrast, never any barium in the urinary tract, just mention that. Um, and there's only one x-ray that you need, and it needs to be during avoiding phase. So you don't need to do pull-out and injections under pressure. Really, the most important thing is you just get your urinary catheter in there, you fill up the bladder really well with uh, your contrast agent, and it can be diluted, it doesn't have to be very, very dark. Um, you just want to have the bladder nice and filled, and then you pull your catheter out with your hand protected with a leaded glove, you press on the bladder, and you start, you induce voiding. So the patient has to be either under general anesthesia or heavily sedated. And by inducing voiding, you're pressing on the bladder, and you're filling up the urethra, and then you take one radiograph at that point. You don't have to take 50 radiographs. It's not that involved a procedure. That's all you need to do. The key to this exam, however, is to have your bladder really nice and filled. And so here we have different um, normal sister urethrograms that are well done. We've got two male dogs and... Up there, we've got a female cat. Um, it's normal to see the urethral papilla kind of stop like that, and then it trickles out through the vestibule. Um, and this is a, a normal cat up there. So this is a normal sister urethrogram. It's normal to have a little bit of kinking of the urethra. And so as you can see, I might just play that again. The bladder is very filled, it's very rounded, it's what you want, you want to press, you want to get good filling, and then it comes out through the, the prep use. So this was a cat that actually was having some difficulties urinating after having removed a urinary catheter. And so he thought, you know, we'll just put a urinary catheter back in, and let's just do some contrast radiographs and make sure there's not a stone or a stricture, and everything was fine. So it's very reassuring. So those cats that are just not peeing in your practice, instead of just recatheterizing and, and waiting and recatheterizing and trying medical therapy, before you pull the catheter out, do a sister urethrogram and just make sure that you're not um, fighting you know, a stricture, that there's not a stone or something else that's made me causing an issue that's preventing this cat from urinating. So this is going to save your life a number of times. One um, just kind of warning is if you do have a patient that um, is not urinating after, uh, again, uh, multiple catheterization. This was a kitty, actually, that was referred to a surgeon for a perineal urethrostomy. After the perineal urethrostomy, the kitty was still not urinating and was referred to me. And when we did the cystourethrogram, the kitty has 
a proximal urethral stricture. So it's just really important before you do a perineal urethrostomy or any kind of surgery that you make sure you've identified the region that's affected and why that kitty is not urinating. If for some reason you cannot get a urinary catheter in, let's say there's a stricture or you just cannot get a urinary catheter in, you can do the passive filling, as I told you, through the vestibule if it's a female, or if it's a male cat, what you can do is by cystocentesis inject contrast into the bladder and then do a voiding at that point and see really where the obstruction is. So not being able to get a cath urinary catheter in is not a reason to not be able to do a cystourethrogram to identify where the site of obstruction is. You can do it by simply filling the bladder with contrast um, through an approach like a cystocentesis with a 22 gauge needle. There might be a little tiny bit of leakage of contrast afterwards, but that's of no concern. Like that happens after cysto sometimes too. And we're just going to finish up um, with some kidneys. So I know we had a kidney talk before. There's a kidney talk uh, coming after. Um, so to look at kidneys on ultrasound, please go ahead and do it in your practice. Um, don't just stop the bladder. Look at kidneys. The more normal kidneys you see, the better you'll get at identifying obstructed kidneys. And ureteral obstruction is very, very common in cats with chronic kidney disease. And even though you're not seeing stones on radiographs, they can still have ureteral obstruction because 25% of kitties will have ureteral obstruction secondary to strictures and not stones. So you're not necessarily going to be seeing stones. The only way you can diagnose the ureteral obstruction, radiographs will not tell you that, but ultrasound will. And these are just some obstructed kidneys and so pretty easy to see on ultrasound that there's a little pool there in the area of the pelvis. There's different medical management protocols that can be done. We'll go over that quickly. Um, the best way right now that we're treating ureteral obstruction with multiple stones is by placing a subcutaneous ureteral bypass, or what's called a sub. They can be a little technically challenging to place, um, so it needs to be done by someone who has had formal training and some experience, and certainly there's a learning curve. Um, but I often get the question, is, is it really worth it? Do they really do well? All we hear about is them getting encrusted and, and infections. Um, well, the answer is yes, and we've actually performed a retrospective study that's similar to a retrospective study um, that was also performed out of uh, AMC, and our results are very similar. It's about 96% successful um, to decrease creatinine in all these patients, and some of these patients had creatinines that were very, very elevated. 94% survival to discharge, and there are some complications and long-term follow-up that's needed, as with all uh, chronic kidney disease patients. Um, but there's very few complications post-operative, and long-term there are some infections, um, some mineralization, but most of the time those can be handled with medical therapy, antibiotic therapy, or decalcifying agents. And so, in general, certainly the complications would not prevent me from placing a sub because most patients do really, really well with them. So just to conclude, um, is that certainly minimally invasive stone removal has many, many advantages. Uh, I hope I've convinced you of some of those advantages. And I hope that you have a few tricks also that you'll be able to take home for catheterization and that you have the, the, uh, the um, that you want to do some urohydropulsion. I guess the way I would, I would um, suggest is that if you have a case of, that you think could be a good case for urohydropulsion, tell the owner that you'll do a cystotomy. Try the urohydropulsion before. That way you have nothing to lose. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. You're going to cystotomy anyways. But if you're able to do urohydropulsion and get them out, all the better. And you don't have the stress on you of succeeding or not. So those are some of the better cases to try. Is that if it works, great. If it doesn't, you're going to cystotomy anyways. Um, and certainly, as time goes on and more and more of these procedures are becoming available, interventional medicine is definitely um, you know, opening up and improving quality of life and care for our patients. And if you're doing any ferrets, exotics, or any of the other species, then all of these techniques that we've looked at apply to those species too. Uh, if you are interested in uh, interventional medicine, there is a Society of Interventional Radiology and Endoscopy that has a very active and interesting listserv. Um, I just gave you the, uh, the uh, we email address, uh, the website, if you want to have a look. And I'd just like to thank you for your attention.